Thanks for joining us for the message. We see this as the central part of our worship service. We'll have someone from our congregation read the passage and jump right into the text. Our nation's leaders in drafting the 2022 fiscal year budget for health funding replaced the word mothers with birthing people. You may have seen in the news this past March when they were seeking to confirm our new Supreme Court Justice, Ketanji Brown Jackson, she was asked, can you provide a definition for the word woman? She said, I can't. I'm not a biologist. (laughs) How can it be that after thousands of years of history with people, We've come to the place that we cannot define the simplest of terms. But I would like to say, Happy Mother's Day. (laughs) With all of the confusion, if we can't define what a woman is, we certainly can't define what a mother is. What are we celebrating today? So Happy Mother's Day. And... Whenever there is confusion, I find the safest place for me to go is right here to the scriptures. And I realize that's not where everybody turns, but to me, it brings great settledness and peace. So what I'd like to do this morning is read from the first three chapters of Genesis in the beginning and selected verses to describe what God sees about woman and motherhood. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the flesh of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The man called his wife's name, you know what it is? Eve, because she is the mother of all living. You read through that, it it is incredible what God states. This morning we'll move from what I would say chaos in our culture to clarity to confidence. This is how we should live with confidence. And as we come to see how God answers this question, what is a woman and what is a mother? So we begin with chaos. (laughs) We see it all around us. In recent years, what would have once been considered unthinkable 
and completely absurd in our world has gone from, from that to being accepted and normalized and then promoted and now forced upon us. Do you see that? And with relative speed, it has taken place. I paraphrase the poet Alexander Pope. Sin is a monster of such awful mien that left unguarded is but to be seen, but seen too oft with familiar face, we first endure, then pity, and then embrace. So today, what is a mother? How will we answer what is a mother? Can you believe we're even asking that question? Why all the confusion? If we're going to say Happy Mother's Day, we need to define this. Now there is not just the reality of this chaos, but there's a reason for it. It is man's attempt to answer life's basic questions. We call them knowledge questions. And every person in the world will ask these questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? And the big one, what is truth? Everyone will ask that at some point. You wonder, how do we get to this place where Grade school kids, kindergartners, junior high, high school, adults are asking, who am I? Who am I? I still remember taking my grandkids to watch Kung Fu Panda. It, it was really great. We're all sitting there, and if you watch this, adults, you'll... You, Kung Fu Panda at that one point says, who am I? And there's this pause. And my grandson at the time, probably six years old, jumps out of his seat. He says, you're Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> it's like a six-year-old could tell you who Kung Fu Panda is, what a woman is, what a mother is. But the more we try to resolve this, you see, it's, it's either there is a God or there isn't a God. If you read in Proverbs, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There is no God. Now, you could say that's an atheist statement. But actually, it is not a statement of not believing in God. It is a statement of rebellion against God. Because in the Hebrew, it's, it's, it's say, saying this, the fool has said in his heart, no, God. Because he knows every person in this world is created with the knowledge of God. You read through Romans, you read through all of the Psalms, and you realize that God creates went within us. As Blaise Pascal said, a, a, va a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fill. So there is the knowledge of God, but when we reject him and refuse him and we cast God out of the equation, then we have to figure everything out. Like, who am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And we have to figure out what is truth. So if you were to ask our government or our Supreme Court, what is truth? Can you imagine the answers you would get. <laughs> we call this our worldview. A worldview is, is the, the picture. It's like the picture frame of how you see everything. <clears throat> and your worldview either has God or doesn't. And as we consider looking at this world womanhood, motherhood, and every other issue. Only God will bring us to peace and to have clarity. If there is no God, in our picture, we are going to have chaos. And we have tried to remove, the world has removed God from everything, and so we have chaos. When you, when you see the picture with God in it, 
there is what we move to our next point from chaos, clarity. He makes it very clear. He makes it very clear. So clarity. God's truth. All truth is God's truth. And his truth is authoritative. He begins in Genesis, in the beginning, God. So before time began, in the beginning, he already existed. God is. God has spoken. God has communicated to us. God has sent his son. God has given his Holy Spirit. He has written to us the words of truth. And he tells us, my word is truth. It doesn't just contain truth. As many people say, well, there's some truth in there. No, it is truth. It is truth. Every word of God is pure. And I realize that someone who doesn't believe in God is going to throw that out and reject it. But I would say to them, prove that statement wrong. Prove it wrong. Look through life. Look through history. Look through science. People say, well, science says this. I say, science doesn't say that. You say that. To me, the, the scriptures are absolutely consistent with science. Absolutely consistent. Now, obviously, there are some things we didn't know. <laughs> we weren't there. But we have no reason not to believe this is absolute truth, and it is sufficient for us. He has given us everything we need to live the Christian life. Now, it's a thick book if you've read through it. You say, well, it doesn't cover everything. No, it doesn't mention everything. But it gives you everything you need in, in precept or principle to live this life. It is sufficient. And he gives it to us for our good. He gives, he gives us his word. You say, well, he gives us that book to put a thumb on us. And a lot of people view God as giving us his laws or his rules, and he's going to put a thumb on us. Well, that's the way the world, the culture, will interpret this. Here's what he says. And you will know the truth, and the truth will... Set you free. Now, they quote that all the time. But when you know the truth, and he says, I am the truth. God is truth. Christ is truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The word is truth. He's given us the truth. And we know the truth, and the truth will set us free. Free from the bondage of anxiety and fears. And give us peace. His word gives us clarity. Now to the point of our topic today. I just had to lay that groundwork because when we come to anything in life, we have to come to a worldview. What are we going to believe? The truth. Here is how he defines woman, wife, and mother. We're getting to mother, but how does God Defined woman. And I'm going to put a word up here. Azer. Now, normally I don't throw Hebrew words out. <laughs> like, what am I going to do with this? This one I want you to remember. Okay? This is the word that we find in Genesis for woman. We're also going to see the root of it is mother, wife, and mother. Woman, wife, and mother. Azer. Now, when I translate this into English for you, I'll just tell you, the world will choke on it. They're going to choke on this word. Because they don't understand. Azer. Translated into English. You ready? Helper. Oh, I knew it. <laughs> Some little slave, an assistant, a little helper. Woman, wife, mother. Azer. Helper. 
And this is why when you don't understand, women will, will scream and claw and fight to get out of this subjected position of being some little assistant running around helping the man. Now, as I said, when you take God out of your framework, that's what you're going to come with. But let's ask God, what do you mean by Azer? Azer defines God himself. He calls himself Azer. Christ is referred to as Azer. The Holy Spirit is referred to as Azer. So, follow me on this. Psalm, this is a good example of it. Psalm 46, verses 1 through 5. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help, Azer, in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. So if almighty, all-powerful, all-wise, infinite God refers to himself as Azer, and he calls this creation Azer, is that a lesser thing? Christ, in Hebrews 4.16, we're talking about him. In him we find grace to help. And how has Jesus helped us? In his three and a half years of ministry, he helped everybody, the blind, the sick, the lame, the lepers, the marginalized. Jesus was himself a helper. Do we think less of him because he did that? And the Holy Spirit, in John 16, Jesus says, I will send to you, and actually, he doesn't say Holy Spirit, he says, I will send to you the helper. He is God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, our Azer. He has the ability to do all things. He has the desire for us. So this word, when I think of it at the root of woman, of wife, help meet, helper, help meet, and mother, is powerful, it is influential, and it is beautiful. It is the kind of person you want to see walking into your life, isn't it? Not with a finger pointed in judgment, but when you see the helper Christ, helper the Father, helper the Holy Spirit come to you, or a helper or mother coming to help you, <laughs> it just makes life better. This is the word that God has chosen to give us in Genesis, Azer. But the world's twisted it. And you know what? It doesn't take long for even Christians to get kind of influenced by it. Every single woman, God defines every single woman, you don't have children, Azer. Every wife, he defines you, Azer. Every mother, he defines you, Azer. That's why we say, you walk out, pick up a gift. Because <laughs> we're celebrating Azer today, particularly mothers. So we move from chaos to clarity to confidence. And this is what we need to have today is a boldness, a confidence and assurance and a peace about who we are. When you look at yourself and you think as a woman, as a wife, as a mother, who am I? I'm an azer.
These things prove out to be true. Mothers in particular, and I'm going to take some time on this because I want you to see your significance in that word. On Mother's Day, our attention is drawn to the overwhelming task of being a mother. Think of all the things a mother is to be and do and accomplish in this monumental task. A chef, maid, seamstress, chauffeur, teacher, nutritionist, resident, psychologist, nurse, veterinarian, guidance counselor, financial advisor, interior decorator, fashion consultant, gardener, repairman, plumber, and last but not least, exterminator. <laughs> and if that isn't challenging enough, a mother is called upon to constantly adjust to the different stages of motherhood it is, as described in the following. I have here what's something I'm going to read to you. It's the abridged chronicles of motherhood. And someone in my household wrote it. <laughs> lives with me. I asked her if I could have permission to read this. She says, remember that first stage, anticipating the birth of your first child? Our thoughts and actions turn to all things baby as we plan for their arrival. We're thrilled, yet a little fearful, not knowing what to expect. We should have had our first clue that motherhood was not going to be easy when it begins with something called labor. <laughs> Anticipation is over, and exhaustion sets in, and we begin to wonder if all there is to life are diapers, running noses, dishes, and laundry. At the end of a routine day, we might find ourselves still in our nightgown, mumbling, I used to be somebody. <laughs> I really did. But you look into that little face, nothing could be more important. Then comes the grasshopper days. Yes, our precious toddlers, why call them grasshopper days? Well, have you ever tried to organize a field of grasshoppers? <laughs> Think about it. It's a picture of how in control we really are during those days. We're just trying to make it to the end of the day with a smile on, their fa on our face. Then come those wonderful elementary years of discovery with all those endless questions not only do you have a tired body, you now have a tired mind. Mischief seems to be their constant companion. If you have a boy, that is. And oh, how we long to protect them during these years. Ah, and then teenagers. Need we say more? In the, world of, in the words of Charles Dickens, it was the best of times and the worst of times. We wonder if we'll ever be emotionally stable again. And we learn that if we can remain calm during this period, we just don't have all the facts. We find ourselves constantly praying and they that they continue in the things they've learned and have a heart for God. We emerge from that challenge and enter into the empty nest where we look back with joy and some loss and wonder what's next. All the children are gone and life takes on a different perspective. Still a mother, still a counselor, now a friend. All those other stages of motherhood flash by and we realize we've been part of an incredible, incredible calling of God. A powerful, influential, beautiful helper. It is being used to mold and shape a life. All the sacrifices seem so small in light of this. But then, just when you think your work is done, life adds a new role with a new name. Grammy. <laughs> and I think it might be the best of all. So I have here, too, a little thing I want to read on a description of a grandmother by a third grader. 
A grandmother is a lady who has no children of her own. <laughs> she likes other people's little girls and boys. <laughs> Grandmothers don't have anything to do except be there. <laughs> They're so old that they shouldn't play hard or run. <laughs> now I'm gonna pause here for a moment and not say anything. <laughs> it is enough if they drive us to the dollar store and let us pick out anything we want, <laughs> or if they take us for walks and slow down past things like pretty leaves and caterpillars. They never say hurry up. Usually grandmothers, <laughs> usually grandmothers are fat. <laughs> but not too fat to tie your shoes. <laughs> they wear glasses and funny underwear. <laughs> they can take their teeth and gums off, too. <laughs> Grandmothers don't have to be smart. Only answer questions like, why isn't God married? And how come dogs chase cats? Grandmothers don't talk like visitors do because it's hard to understand. When they read to us, they don't skip or mind if the same story is read again. Everyone should try to have a grandmother, especially if they don't have a television, <laughs> because they are the only grown-ups who have time. So we listen to the chronicles of a mother, all these different stages. There is sacrifice, there is work, there's the loss of your mind, the loss of your energy, maybe the loss of dreams you may want to have chased. But then you think, we have a lot to celebrate and to give thanks to God for. All through these stages, I still remember after we were married and have, had kids and I was on some trip and I decided that going through Kansas City, I thought decided to go over to Ottawa and stop and visit Diane's mom and dad. And I knocked on the door and you, a lot of you know Mary Stralo. She's in Florida now, it got <laughs> cold this winter so she went to Florida, she'll be back. She'll be 94 in September. But this is a few years ago and she came to the door and she said, oh, Matt, it's so good to see you gave me a big hug. And she said, let me take your bag. My mother-in-law, let me take your bag. You set that right here. You come right over here and sit down. She put me down in the chair and leaned it back. <laughs> let me take your shoes off. She took my shoes off, got a blanket, put it over, <laughs> over me. And she said, I'm going to get you an iced tea. Gave me a big iced tea. She said, I'm making dinner. You just sit here and relax. I tell this to Diane, she says, what, what is going on here? You know, you get all that, We're, we just laugh. But I, I tell you this about my mother-in-law, and God has blessed me with, with a mom like that. I'm thinking particularly my mother-in-law, she's still living. And um, all my life long, she's been encouragement to me. She is like the biggest fan, the biggest encourager, the biggest helper. And not just to me, to everyone else. Do you know how many kids and grandkids and related people she has in her family? I think it's over 60 now. And she'll be at the counter in our kitchen writing notes, making phone call. Yes, texting. She'll be texting all of them and praying for them. And it's like she is the greatest encourager in our family. And when I think of Azer, when I think of helper, it's not just for this time and then you're done. It's her whole life, and probably now as much as ever before. There is never a perfect mother. Most mothers kind of beat themselves up. They couldn't do a better job. Don't do that. God has blessed you with a unique, uniquely
uniquely designed role. He has designed you as a helper. And all of us, all of us benefit from that. Of your power, of your influence, of your beauty. Now you knew that I'd have to bring up Proverbs 31. A virtuous woman who can find anything. I knew it. I knew he was going to bring that up. I, I hate that woman. <laughs> well, I've, I've got news for you. She's not real. It's not really a person. It's an ideal. So when you have an ideal, no one measures up. It's, it's like follow Christ. Live like Christ. Paul says, follow me as I follow. You know, you never live up to that. So, but when we hear, oh, Proverbs 31. <laughs> but I want you to think about this. This is an example of, of, of the ideal. It talks about a woman. It talks about a wife. It talks about a mother. It says she, in, in verse 20, it says she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. This has nothing to do with her husband or her kids. It's a helper. See, it's in the character and the fiber of God's creative work. You say, well, I don't have a husband. I don't have kids. God still formed you this way and designed you this way. So this is when you walk with him, you're fulfilling his purpose for your life. This is what she does. She, she is helping. And everyone's life is better. Because of that, the wife says her, her husband praises her. His life is better. And her children, in verse 28, rise up and call her blessed. So if the Supreme Court justices cannot define reality, cannot define woman or mother or wife in this world, and we will continue in this world if the, the picture has no God to have chaos. All around us have chaos. But we have clarity as believers. We have absolute clarity and the clarity I want you to see is this word, azer. It, it's, it's, it's clear. And that clarity brings us to confidence. It brings us to confidence. I realize that you walk out these doors, you go to work, and you live in your neighborhood, you turn on the TV, all around is chaos. We go back to this clarity and it gives us confidence until the Lord returns. So let's celebrate today, Mother's Day. Not because we have a perfect mother, but because it points to a perfect God and Christ and Holy Spirit who is the Azer. And everything we experience through our earthly mothers, we appreciate and value. Happy Mother's Day.